Hello everybody. Welcome to all Grade 11 learners and Grade 11 educators. Um, my name is Linda Hackner. I'm Director of Education at Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. And behalf of everyone at, at the center and all, our, all my colleagues, we welcome you to Unit 3 um, of the curriculum that you have in Grade 11, which deals with theories of race and effects on governments in the 19th and 20th century. And today's unit, we're gonna be talking about eugenics. Now, grade 11s, you will remember in the previous unit, we spoke about social Darwinism and race theories, racial theories. And we spoke about the consequences of this so-called scientific, pseudo-scientific justification of prejudice and racism. Um, leading, of course, to individual racism and, of course, institutional racism, which we in South Africa know all about. Um, social Darwinism underpinned and justified colonialism, cultural domination, oppression, slavery, etc. We now move on to what happened sort of in the 1900s, early 1900s, a, 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 a group was formed called, a movement was formed called the eugenics movement. And the eugenics movement um, was a pseudo-scientific movement. It was scientists. Um, and they believed in programs and policies which advocated, which, which spoke for ridding society of inferior social traits or social behaviors or the way people behaved in society that they didn't like. And the way they were gonna do this was to force sterilization. Now, grade 11s, um, sterilization, as I'm sure you know, means stopping people from having children. And they did this by operating on people both male and female, who they thought were so-called unfit. Remember with social Darwinism, you have the survival of the fittest and then the unfit. And remember fit, we don't mean gym, we mean survival of the most able to produce in society. So they forcibly um, believed in the forcible sterilization of certain people in society. Now, where does the, all this begin? Well, the word eugenics comes from the Greek eugenies, um, which means well-born or a good creation, something that sounds positive. The first person to use this term, really, to coin the term, was Sir Francis Galton, who look at the dates when he lived. So social Darwinism is out there. And he applied the principles of social Darwinism to the belief that the biological health of human beings could be improved, that we as human beings could take control of our own evolution, and we could do this by selective breeding. Who should breed with whom? Well, grade 11s, let me explain to you that selective breeding is nothing new. Farmers have been doing selective breeding since animals were domesticated centuries and centuries ago. Farmers understood, you've got a cow that gives milk and you've got another cow that gives a lot of milk. If you breed the two good milkers, then you're going to get a cow that produces even more milk. And what does that mean? It means more produce. It means you can sell more milk. That's good for, for you as a farmer and for the economy. They realized the same things with chickens. You could breed chickens that laid a lot of eggs with other chickens that laid a lot of eggs to get chickens that laid a very lot of eggs. So they did that with, with sheep to produce more wool, to produce better meat. So selective breeding is not new, but selective breeding with human beings is something that we need to think about. So the eugenics movement says science, it's a science, we know it's pseudoscience, of human improvement through selective breeding. We choose who can breed with who, and by so doing, you rid society of so-called inferiors, and how do you go about this? Well, 
grade 11s have a look at those words. You take your ideas from farming. You breed healthy human beings with other healthy human beings. They have children. That's good genetic stock. You can see the farming words, breeding and stock. And you get rid of, therefore, those that are weak, those that are inferior, those that they called degenerate, less than good stock. So now, you encourage then positive eugenics, breeding the best with the best, and you discourage reproduction of the weak. That's called negative eugenics. Look at those two images there. Positive eugenics, breeding the best with the best. Negative eugenics, discouraging reproduction of those that you don't consider to be good stock. Why would you do this? Well, if you've got the best of the best, then you can focus on progress and power and build a good community. If you discourage reproduction of the weak, then you're not wasting money and resources on those who are not productive in society. Grade 11, this all sounds very, very harsh. Um, and it is harsh. But in the minds of the, of the um, early 20th century scientists, pseudoscientists, they believed they were fostering public good. Grade 11s, you know, I always talk to you about context. Okay, so what's happening is you've got the Industrial Revolution, as I mentioned to you, if I'm talking about England, people coming into the cities, it became very crowded, people got ill, there was crime, um, there was disease. So the eugenics movement is not in one place, it's not only in Europe, please note, it's worldwide. And it sees itself as doing good. It's optimistic that scientific changes in our breeding habits, scientific changes, they believe, would solve many complex problems. And so the eugenicists, what do they favor? Well, they favor better public health. That's great. We have that in South Africa. We've got public health systems. Good. They favor family planning. We've got family planning um, set up here in South Africa. You plan your family so you have as many children as you can cope with. More thoughtful education about how you reproduce, about pre preparing for marriage. Very good. All of those things we can believe in. Unfortunately, forced sterilization of those they considered to be unfit we can't really believe it. And this is where the eugenicists become a bit, it becomes a little bit uncomfortable. So grade 11s, I've said to you that it's worldwide. Let's have a look at countries that practiced eugenics, countries across the world. You've got Argentina, Australia. Now there's a case study that we're gonna do on Australia to show you how they used eugenics. Australia, Brazil, Austria, Canada, China, Finland, France, Germany. We're going to do a case study on Germany, Nazi Germany, how they saw eugenics. Great Britain, Italy, Japan, Korea, Mexico, New Zealand, Norway, Russia, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, United States of America. It was worldwide. There were universities in these countries that had departments where professors um, looked at eugenics, where you studied eugenics. Now, most of these countries put forced sterilization into law. Most of them. And let me tell you, grade 11s, that some of these laws were only repealed, were only taken away in the late 70s, sometimes even later. Grade 11, thank you for watching. I hope that gives you some background to the eugenics movement so that when we look at our case studies, you've got in your mind what eugenicists were thinking. And I look forward to see you, seeing you again in Unit 4 when we look at case study Australia. Bye-bye.